the man who preaches relationships over transactions. Allow me to introduce to you all Ricky Carew. What's up, Miami? How we doing? This is crazy. Good to see all you guys. You want to do something for me real quick? If you came here today to learn how to build a better real estate business, give me five seconds and get loud. Yes. Raise your hand if you want to learn how to be more efficient. Raise your other hand if you want to learn how to scale your business. Like Camilla said, um, as a single agent with one assistant since 2014, I've sold over 100 properties a year. Okay, so think about it for just a second. Let it digest. 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, and going on 19, 20, 21, right? Do you think that I know just a little bit about how to be efficient and how to scale my business? Okay, I'm a single agent doing these numbers. Um, Zero to Diamond to me is not just a free real estate coaching program. Okay, it, it's, it's a symbol. It's a, it's a real estate movement. We're, I'm reducing the failure rate. For those of you who don't understand why I'm here, what I'm doing, what my mission is, is to reduce the failure rate, which is, which is incredibly high. I want to reduce the failure rate in the real estate industry. And it's happening. I have agents emailing me every week talking about they've tried everything, they were about to have to quit, and then they found me online somewhere and started implementing just the little simple things. Okay, everything is free. The difference in the difference in, in, in paid coaching and free coaching to me, and the reason why I'm growing so fast, we're signing up 50 agents a day. And when I say we, it's just me. I'm the I'm the whole company, right? But the reason it's growing so fast is not because it's free and it's just, it's just oh, let's sign up for this free thing. It's because when I make a video, it's really me. I'm not trying to hide anything hoping that you pay me for some secret that I'm leaving out to the public. And so I can be completely genuine and tell you every little secret to how I'm doing my business, the ins and outs. Ask me a question, DM me. I answer every single DM. And it takes a lot of time out of my day, but why do I do it? Because I really want to help reduce the failure rate. I see what's happening out there, and to me, it's just crazy. I think this is the new age uh, of the industry. Um, you know, do you want to buy or sell is 1980s. Is there anything in the world I can do to help you is today's world. Providing value up front. Seeing what you can do to help them. I think that I was talking with an agent earlier and she started using my script. She started, you know, she was always making calls, but she used to make the calls looking for deals. And if a prospect wasn't ready to do a deal right then, then she would just move on, right? That's what she was coached to do. That's what she was taught to do. But you're talking to the prospect anyway. That, that's a precious moment in time that you actually got the property owner on the phone. And in this moment, you can't let it pass. You may never talk to this person ever again. Why not? put yourself in a position to create this relationship, a deep relationship with them for the future because the fact is that they are going to buy or sell something in the future. It may be next month, a year, two years, five years, 
20 years, it's going to happen. And so we have this precious moment where we're talking to them. Let's take advantage of it. Quit thinking so short term about how do I do a deal today and start concentrating on how can I help people and create relationships today. When you have a phone call session, you don't get any appointments, you feel bad, but you are focused on the appointment. When you wrote that moment that you realize appointments do not matter whatsoever, the best thing for that client may be an appointment, but it may not be an appointment, right? But we're just coached to go after the appointment, set the appointment. You're not listening to what they want what's best for them. So, I'm just getting warmed up here, guys. Are y'all ready for this? Yeah. I want to take some Q&A at the end. I want to, I want to get hyped with some Q&A. I love Q&A. Um, before I get really started, I do want to give a couple shout-outs, especially the man that put all this together, Camelo, wherever he is. This guy worked his butt off of this. Um, so, just a quick story. He found me on Instagram um, about three months ago. We met each other three months ago on Instagram. Um, we messaged back and forth. We ended up talking on the phone, and he said, I want to do an event down here in Miami, and I'm going to have you on the big screen. You don't even have to come down here. And I said, great. Let's do it, because I love doing you know, a Zoom call with offices, I love doing that. If any, if anybody here wants me to do a Zoom call with their office and do a Q&A and, or a presentation or something like that, just hit me up and let's set it up because I love doing those. So that's what I thought it was gonna be. You know, like a Zoom call thing for all you guys and he was talking about maybe 50 agents or something like that. And after a couple weeks, I watched him work and I, I saw the work he was putting into it and I actually noticed that there was some serious potential for this, and I called him up and I said, hey man, I'm just gonna come down there. Yeah. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, let me, let's just come down there and I wanna just, let's just blow this thing up. And you did. Because I knew there was people that, that needed to hear my message and what I'm really trying to do industry-wide, worldwide. So here we are. Um, so big shout out, you know, big shout out to uh, Lincoln Spear Brewery for letting us use the, their facilities. <laughs> this place is legit. And also my, my uh, videographer Blake, give him a quick. <laughs> so when I was really young, really little boy, I knew that I had something. I didn't know what. But there were two qualities that that I noticed really early that were gonna take me somewhere really far. I didn't know where, I didn't know how, right? But I knew I had these two things. I was really curious about stuff. I wanted to know how things worked, you know? I wanted to just know stuff, I was curious. And I was really, really competitive. I wanna be the best at everything. And when you, when you really think about those two qualities and you combine those two qualities, it's, it's a really special thing, okay? You're really curious about how things work in terms of real estate. It's like, how did the top producer get there? How's he selling all this property, right? And when you, when, you, when you are curious enough to acquire that knowledge and then you add on top that you're really competitive and now you know what they're doing, the competitive side of you makes you outwork them so that you can be the best. Because that's the only way to be the best, is to outwork everybody, is to learn what they're doing and outwork them. And so, work ethic was never really in it for me. Work ethic was a secondary characteristic for me through being so competitive. I wanted to beat everybody in sports. You know, I wanted, to, I wanted to practice harder. I wanted to beat everybody. When I was a teenager, I started roofing with my father. Um, again, 
were very competitive. He was the best. He was the best on any job site. He laid more shingles than anybody. Sorry, Dad, I want to be the best. Now, I learned what he did. I watched him. And then I started putting the work in. The last, one of the last roofs we ever did together, I'll never forget it. I beat him to the top. And it wasn't just beat him to the top, right? I was in the valley, right? A valley comes in, you're putting shingles over each other, weaving them up the roof. He's just on a straight, straight to the top. And I beat him up the valley. And that, that was a real, that was something I'll never for, forget because it, it, it proved to me that if I did put the work in, if I was curious enough to figure out how to do it, and then I was competitive enough to put the work in, then I could be the best. And that was, that was a real moment for me. Shortly after that, I got my real estate license. I was 20 years old. It was 2002. Um, so now I'm roofing and doing real estate. Actually, I fell, I fell in a history class. I went to four different colleges in two years. And I said, college is not for me. I felt like more of a liability than an asset. My parents were paying a lot of money for me to go to college, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I realized that the real estate, to get your license is one class. So you're telling me I can get my license in one class, or I can go to school for 10 years and be a doctor or lawyer and really have the same opportunities to make the same, you know, kind of money and stuff. Okay. So, of course, I went the real estate route. This this opened up my my, my eyes to the fact that curiosity and, and being competitive, right, are really important, but also being efficient. If you really look back at my life and how everything has kind of played out, and really point at the activities and the actions, you know, it, it's really, it's these small little efficiencies that, that most people don't get. It's the little efficiencies that add up to be so big over time. Um, so I get my license, uh, I, I quit roofing. I was like, I'm retired now from roofing, I'm done with that. I, I sell real estate for 30 days, don't sell anything, have to go back to roof. I'm back on the roof, I'm selling real estate at the same time, trying to figure real estate out. It took me eight months to make my first sale. How many people here sold a property in fewer than eight months of, of getting their license? You guys are way ahead of me. If you give it 20 years from now, you guys will be light years ahead of me. Now, it is, it is a completely different world now. Uh, when I started, there was no Zillow, there was no Facebook. The technology was basically zero at that time. We barely, barely had emails and you know text messaging and stuff. Barely had MLS. MLS was brand new right before I started real estate. So I made my first sale. It was my grandmother's condo. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> But I did sell a condo of just a prospect that I worked and helped him, and I sold his condo. It closed the same day. I had two closings. My, my first closing was two closings in one day. And uh, two deals. From there on, I sold two a month for a long time. And I was able to you know, do real estate full time. And here I am, I'm 21. I start making some really good money. Then the market completely explodes, and I become a self-made millionaire overnight. By the time I'm 23, I've got Hummers, two Hummers, Cadillacs, houses, and a lot of properties. And I borrowed a lot of money to buy those properties. I was flipping. The market crashes, and you know the reason I did the properties is because. Growing up, for me, like the golden rule, because we never had money. My parents didn't know what to do with money because we never had money. So they can't 
teach somebody what to do with money because they, they've never done it themselves. But the golden rule was always buy property. So that's what I did. Like I, I bought a lot of property, I borrowed a lot of money, and I thought, I'm good. Like this is this is you know, this is it. I'm done. This I'm fixing to be like multi gazillionaire. Then the market crashes. And when the market crashed, everybody kept saying, give it two years, it'll come back. Then two years would go by and they said, give it two years, it'll it'll come back. Two more years went by, give it two more years, it'll come back. Because people don't most people don't understand completely that when the crash happened, real estate started to go down in price around in 2005. The stock market didn't completely tank until 2008, right? People, everybody associates the crash with that. But property started to go down in 2005. If you watch the movie The Big Short, uh, when the guy bet against uh, all this, he knew, he, he saw, he knew it was going to happen. You know, he got real mad because people were delinquent on their notes long before that stock went down. And he was he was mad because, you know, he was thinking, this is not the way that it's supposed to go. But they were just prolonging it. It, 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 was, it was already crashing long before it crashed. The guys on Wall Street just didn't want it. They didn't want it, they didn't want it to crash yet. So they did everything they could to prolong it. But it crashed. In 2005, it started going down. When the market crashed and I had all these loans, I kept trying to hang on and have reserves, but I, I kept paying off the loans with the reserves, thinking it was going to come back, and it never did. I ended up losing everything. I lost every single thing I had. I was living in a car that was given to me, sleeping on friends' couches. This is 2007. 2006. 2006, it all finally, the whole house of cards completely failed. 2000, I went back to roofing houses. Now I'm back roofing houses again. Well, that business was really bad too. The, the whole economy was bad. It wasn't just real estate or this or that, it was everything. 2007, I get a job on an oil rig. Now I'm working on an oil rig and I'm thinking, this is great because I'm there every other week. And so I can work one week on the rig and one week in real estate. One on the rig, one on real estate. Didn't work out like that because when you work an all rig, you work six o'clock at night till six in the morning, one whole week, then you go home, then you recover. Then the next week you work six in the morning till six in the evening. And they so they swap you. So you're always kind of discombobulated. Plus, the work was legit. Like it was crazy out there. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I never I don't think I've ever told anybody this publicly, but the first week that I was on the rig, almost died. I was, uh, the last day, it was a, it was an hour before we were all fixing to go home for the week, and there was an air voice that I was working on all night long, putting, putting the pipe together so that they could drill it in the ground, and uh, every time they would drill one on the ground, I would go up there and, and do what they told me to do, and then when they did it, we had like a 30 minute break in between. Well, during one of those 30 minute breaks when I wasn't standing on that air, standing next to that air voice, I don't know, a 200 pound piece of metal or something fell from about 150 feet up and demolished that, that uh, air voice. It was, it was completely demolished. This was the first week I was on the oil rig. I never told that story, but anyway. Um, I worked on the oil rig for a year. Couldn't Again, like, I was so curious. I wanted to know why I failed. And I was just talking to some guys over here a minute ago, and they wanted to know, like, they said, you know, that, that turning point in your life and your career was when you lost everything, and that's when you realized, you know, what it was supposed to be. You know, what, what was the deal there? Well, what it was is that I was, I was to put it simply, I was thinking, thank God. Because I was 25, and there were guys that were 45 and 55 and 65 right next to me doing the same things I was doing, and they lost everything too. But I was 25, and I thought, thank God, I th this happened to me at this age because I knew that it would never happen to me again. I was going to figure out why it happened. I was going to build it back stronger than before where it would never, ever, ever 
go away. So my curiosity brought me to the agents in my market that were still crushing it through the crash. And I was mind boggled. How are you guys doing this? I wanted to have lunch with them. I wanted to hang out with them. I wanted to go see them. I wanted to ask them questions. And there was a guy by the name of Scott Myrick in Gulf Shores, Alabama. He, uh, when I first started in real estate, he was my mentor. He showed me, like, not labeled mentor. He was just an agent in the office that wanted to help. And he showed me how to look up property owners, what to say, how to call them what letters to write, how to do postcards, how to make labels, just all that stuff. And he helped me. We were, we were at Exit Realty. I've been with seven companies total. You know, through the crash, I moved all around just to stay active and everything. And he had problems. He left real estate for a minute and all this and that. But he was there during the crash, and he was still crushing it. And this is the guy, my, my friend, that helped me when I first started. I went to him and I said, man, you have to tell me what you're doing. How are you selling 30 properties a year and I'm selling nothing? Nobody else is selling anything. How are you doing this? He said, come over. Come over to the house and I'll show you everything I'm doing and we'll, you know, all that stuff. I said, cool. So I go over there. We start going through everything and it's the same Exactly. He showed me how to look up property owners, the numbers, what to say to them, how to do postcards. The same stuff he told me from the beginning was the same exact stuff he told me now. It doesn't change. What changes is the climate of the market. What did I learn through all this? I read over 100 books during this time. That's how curious I was. I don't read as much anymore. I more watch and listen because I'm so busy. It's hard for me to read. But I try to read maybe 10 books a year now. And then I listen to a lot of podcasts and, and YouTube videos and stuff like that. But at the time, I wasn't so busy. And I had time to try to figure this out. So I read 100 books in about a year. So there were other agents too that I studied and wanted to know how they're, they're doing this. After I gathered all my data and, and went back to the drawing board, and I'm still working on the oil rig, I realized a lot of things, okay? This is, this is I'm gonna name all this stuff, and I want you to really think about this and take this with you. When the market crashes, closings still happen every single day. Every single day. Do they go down? Sure. But they still happen every single day. I also realized that business is unlimited. Completely unlimited for each and every agent. That's, a, that's tough to wrap your mind around. Because there's such a widespread, there's, so, there's such widespread thought on scarcity. I was watching a YouTube video this week where a guy said, agents are gonna have to get out of the business when the market crashes because there's not enough business to go around. I'm doing a video right now to rebuttal that because there's plenty of business to go around, right? Unlimited business, it means that there's more than you can handle, right? I think about it like a, like a buffet. Can you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet and eat all the food there? No. It's the same thing with the real estate market, right? There's only so much up there. You can see it all, right? Just like you can see the closings every day and each month and all year. There's only so many, sure. But can you eat it all? No. If you like the chicken and you tell all your buddies, hey, the chicken's really good, and they, they start going after the chicken, do they eat it all? No. They keep bringing out more chicken every day. There's more chicken. Right? It doesn't matter if you tell everybody, I'm coaching for free. I'm telling you how I make a million dollars a year as a single agent, every single last detail. And you know what's really funny? I've been sending out, who gets my emails every day? 
If you're not, just go to my website, zerodiamond.com, and create a free account, and you'll get emails every day. I've been sending those emails out to every single agent in my entire MLS. There's only 2,000 agents in my, in my account. My direct competition, direct. People in my office, people in the office right down the road, all the remaxes that we don't like and all this stuff, right? <laughs> right, even the agents that I have problems with, have weird deals and you know, strange confrontations and stuff, they still get it. I didn't take anybody out. It's not like I was like trying to hide anything. I haven't lost a single deal. Why? Because I'm all in on the fact that it's unlimited and I'm proving it. And so what I want you to do is to, is to see that and, know, and, and recognize that business is unlimited. It doesn't matter that an agent is dominating a subdivision. Okay? There's people in, there's owners in that subdivision that are tired of that agent. That want another agent to step in and start farming that, that subdivision because no other agent is doing it because they're scared that they're not going to get the business because the top agent already has all the business. I could call a subdivision, the whole subdivision. I could use the same exact phone numbers. You could call the same exact subdivision. An hour after I call them, and we're going to have two different sets of results. Because our personalities are so different. We're going to match up with people differently. It's all about connecting with people, making people feel comfortable. And some people are going to like you and some people aren't. You're not going to win them all. You can't call all the property owners in your area ever. You can't call all the property owners in your market ever in your life. It's a fact. Because you might think different. Don't scratch your nose, man. I'm going to point you out. You can't call them all. Everybody agrees with me with that. What does that do? It just proves my point again that it's unlimited. You can't call all the property owners and say, hey, what in the world can I do for you today? Never going to happen. Closings happen every day. Business is completely unlimited. Okay, here's another one. This is a big one. What's up, guys? <laughs> forgot about you. No, I didn't forget about you. Hurts my neck. Uh, who here lost a deal this year so far and didn't like do didn't like how it felt? Y'all are liars. This year's only been Come on, guys. Listen, listen, listen to me. Okay, in your in your entire career, who lost a deal and it hurt? Everybody. I lost like four deals today. Okay? Listen to me. Let me tell you about losing deals. Raise your hand if you know what I'm fixing to say. Good. Nobody. Listen. Losing deals are the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. Number one, they're inevitable. You're not going to win them all. Right? So let's just get that out on the table. You're not going to win every deal. But when you lose the deal, think about this. Okay, you learn something, one, which nobody cares about. Like, you guys aren't even thinking about what you learned from it. You just heard that you lost the deal. And it wasn't even your deal. It's not your property. That money was never even there. You know what I'm saying? It's not even your decision. Somebody else's decision that you hoped that they would make. Right? But you lost it. Okay? But you learn something. Think about what you learn. That makes you a better agent. And this is cliche, right? Oh, you learn something, right? No, 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 no. Listen to what I'm saying. What you learn just made you a better agent, okay? But here's the kicker. When you lose it, you don't have to spend any more time on that deal anymore. And so, like, you get future time back. You get future time back. What, well, how else can you get like time back? Time's our most valuable asset. If you actually took the time that you would have spent on that deal 
and go get five more deals, like initiate five more deals in the same time frame that it would took you to close all those deals, think about where you would be if you did that to every deal you lost. And how happy you would be when you lose deals because you know you're fixing to get five more. Because business is unlimited and closings happen every day. Right? It doesn't matter if everybody knows it. Because they can't do it all. They can't think. I haven't lost a single client since I've been doing this with my local market. I've been waiting for the day where somebody came up and said, this agent called me and sounds exactly like you. Or sends me a weekly email that looks exactly like yours. Hasn't happened yet in two years. Are they just not doing it? I don't know. Somebody has to be doing it, right? I sold more property than anybody in my county last year. Somebody has to be listening to me. They see me doing it firsthand right there. Losing deals back to that. I'll tell you something else. I really want you to, I really want you to take this with you. It's crippling you because you're trying to convert every single deal because you're scared you're going to lose the deal. And you're wasting more time on each, each situation than you should be <laughs> because you're scared you're going to lose it. You're trying, to, you're trying so hard to convert it that it cripples you from, from having time to help other people. Can I say something real? Yep. You know what? Sometimes you're so afraid to hear the word no that you don't shut up. You're afraid for somebody that you know that they might just say no and you just keep talking. Sometimes you have to stop back and listen to the customer, especially when you're on the phone. And we are all afraid of saying no. You're all afraid of making calls. You already said it. So remember, just shut up and listen. And that will give you the audible cue that can lead that conversation further. Agreed. Oh, let me let me take questions at the end, all right? Yeah. So look, <laughs> you're spending so much time trying to convert, you're scared to lose it. Then when you lose it, you're really crippled. Quit trying to convert and just connect. Regardless if they want to do a deal today or not. Does this make sense? Yeah. Give me some. Clap it up. Okay, so here I am, still working on the oil rig. I realize all this, right? The biggest thing that I realized, the biggest, the, the biggest thing I realized, on top of all that stuff like unlimited business and all that crazy stuff that, you know, whatever, relationships over transactions. That was my, that was my main thing was that the whole first half of my career, it was all about the deal. It was all about the deal, the closing, the money. I didn't care about the people. And I realized that was my downfall. That's why I couldn't sell properties through the crash. Because I was going after deals where there's less deals. So I, I was in a scarcity situation. If you think deals, you are in a scarcity situation. <clears throat> think about that for a second. If you're going after deals, if you're going after the money, yeah, there's only so much. But if you think in terms of relationships, that's unlimited. And that pays way more than a transaction. Every prospect that you connect with, regardless if they want to do a deal or not, is worth 10 to 20 deals to you over the life of your career. Through repeat business, referrals, and referrals and referrals. Some of my best clients never even bought a piece of property from me. I showed them property for five days straight 10 years ago. They never bought anything. They've been getting my weekly email ever since. They've referred like 15 people to me in 10 years or something like that, right? I would call that one of my best clients. Never, never bought a piece of property from me. Did I try to get them pre-qualified? No. Did I get them to buy or sign a buyer agency agreement? No. I just want to help them do what I want to do. If a buyer comes to me, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a judgment call. I'm going to evaluate their situation. I'm going to decide: Do I want this or do I not? If I don't, I'm referring it for a referral fee, which I never do, by the way. I never turn anybody down. I don't get enough buyers. I'm not buying leads. And every every buyer I get is from like a referral or a past client, and I have to take it for the sake of the referral. 
or the past client. A lot of people ask me how I do 100 deals a year as a single agent. And it's like, I don't, I don't set out to do 100 deals. I just work every day. And 100 deals is what comes out of it. Like, how do you show all those properties? How do you go to all those appointments? How do you do all this and do all that? I don't know. I just work all day. I do all I can do. I help as many people as I can. I try to be as most efficient as I possibly can. And 100 deals is what comes out the other side. See what I'm saying? To me, there's no equation to it. To me, there's not make this many calls and you're gonna get an appointment or a listing. I have no idea what that number is. And it's different for everybody, right? <coughs> what do I do when I talk to somebody that doesn't wanna do anything, I get their email, put them in my weekly email you know, database, they're getting it, they call me five years later and say, I've been getting your weekly email for five years, I'm ready to do this. Ready to, ready to buy, ready to sell. And I'm like, what's your name? Because I don't spend time organizing and trying to get it all. I don't spend time doing that. That's taking time away from helping more people. I don't want to know all that stuff. If somebody says they want to do something soon, they go on a, uh, uh, they go on a sheet of paper that I keep a list, and I'm going to follow up with them the way that I think they need to be followed up with. Right? I'm going to stay on them. They want to do something. But if they don't want to do anything, what am I going to do with them? Remember their name? For what? There's thousands of them. What are you going to do? Organize it all? you got to be careful about organization. Right? There's a fine line between organization and, and spending too much time, taking, taking time away from doing the things that you really need to do to help a lot of people. Where are we at on time? I want, to, I want to talk about efficiency and scalability real quick. To me, efficiency is, in real estate, <coughs> yeah, there's all these leads, there's all these different things you can do, there's all this way to get business, right? To me, who's the highest quality prospects? Somebody tell me what the highest quality prospect is. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all yeah. are all following me. Um, it's property owners, okay? Why? Because. Because. But you know what efficiency is? It's what makes me the most amount of money in the least amount of time. Okay? Think about it. Property owners buy and sell. They're going to buy or sell, right? They already own. They're going to do something, okay, at some point. Chances are really high. That's pretty high quality. On top of the fact that you can pick your price point. You can say, I want to call a subdivision. I want to be in that $500,000 range. Boom, you're there. You don't have to wait for a buyer lead to come to you that wants something for $150,000. You pick your price point. Okay, now we're being more efficient, right? We're picking our price point and we're dealing with prospects that we know are gonna buy and sell. That's the highest quality that there is in real estate. Does anyone here, just raise your hand, if you know of anything that could be more efficient than just property owners? Raise your hand if you have a rebuttal, yes ma'am. Property owners, you know? Good one. You got me. <laughs> Property owners are the highest quality. And I've already established. Guys, this is, this is like golden stuff. I've already established with you, and you've all already agreed, that, that, you, that, uh, that it's unlimited. You can't call all the property owners ever. So you have an unlimited resource of the highest quality prospects in your market. Every agent does. And you can't call them all. And it doesn't matter if you know the strategy I'm talking about and you, and you try to compete against each other and all that stuff. It's not going to work. It's a buffet. Is this making sense? Yeah. Yeah. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. This is real stuff. This is the stuff nobody really talks about. I can tell you everything that I know, 
because I, I don't want to dime from you. Scalability. Efficiency to me was, hey, quit going after the deal, concentrate on the people, put relationships over transactions every single time. I think, I think, I think one of the best strategies, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, I think one of the best strategies for new agents or, or even or even an agent that's just trying to trying to get some momentum or make something happen, do a deal for free. Like go help a for sale by owner and like really, like not like oh dude, you know, like really like put work in, like hours to help them sell it and not and not ask for anything in return. And see what happens. See what happens. That relationship over that transaction is gonna take you so much further than just trying to do deals. I'm telling you right now, I wish I would have known this a long time ago. All right, I got off track, scalability. When I got back in real estate, okay, 2007, the oil rig, I realized all this. It's about the people, the property owners, all this. I started sending emails because there were so many foreclosures. I was sending emails to everybody in the Southeast saying, Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, foreclosures, the beach is 50% off, come get it. And people responded, a thousand people, that was 2008, a thousand people responded to a million emails and 20 of them bought something. And it's crazy because I got laid off from the oil rig. At the beginning of 2008, I got laid off and I was already dabbling in real estate, and somehow I had a closing lined up, and I got laid off, and I remember right the week before the closing, I had to borrow $500 from my dad just to make it through to that closing, and that was it. As soon as I hit that closing, it was $20,000, I was back in business, and I knew, I, knew, I knew it was over. I knew all the aid and everything was good. Everybody was going to hate me because I was fixing to take over. And that's what happened. I slowly started to, to put the pieces of the puzzle in place. And when I was emailing everybody about the foreclosures, I kept hearing, people kept replying and saying, send me the weekly foreclosures. Send them to me every week. I heard it over and over and over again. And so I started sending them a list of the foreclosures every week. I did it every Wednesday, right? So the more I, was, I did that for a couple weeks, and then I ended up just putting my entire database on there, right? And then I started to put more market information in there than just the foreclosures, right? And then as time went on and the foreclosures went away, it just turned into a market report. This is the evolution of my weekly email that's been going out every Wednesday since 2007. I was still on the oil rig when I started this. 12 years. 12 years every single Wednesday since 2007, okay? Through hurricanes hitting our area, through, you know, oil spills, through weird moments in my life, through changing companies, vacations when I'm not here. It never missed a Wednesday, okay? I started to view that email as the foundation of my business, as a way to create a sense of like glue to hold my business together, to keep everybody in tune with me, and then I'm there to help them. And so I took my <laughs> philosophy of the relationships over transactions and I applied it to this weekly email. I create it every week. It's not, it's, it's original content created by me on a whim every Wednesday. Market information, new listings, pendings, picture, um, market stats, featured properties, so on and so forth, whatever. But it's so deep. The weekly email is so deep that the philosophy behind it, because it does so much, okay? The scalability of it, I want to get into that. But before I do, the consistency of it deepens the relationship for you without you having to call them every year, every six months. When you have thousands of people, you can't call, 
Okay? When you call a past client, they want to talk for 30 minutes and catch up. It's not like a cold call that lasts 30 seconds, a minute, four minutes, right? They, never, they don't know you. It's a quick conversation. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a stick and move situation. But when you call past clients that you've done business with or know who you are, they want to catch up. They want to talk about, you know, their, their daughters and Christmas and everything else. They want to know about you. You get into these conversations, and that's great. you got to do that. But the point is you can't do that for thousands of people. You can't. You can't have a 30-minute call. I mean, how, you, you know, think about how many 30-minute calls you can have in a year. It's not, I mean, I don't know how many I've thought it up, but, you know, it, it's tough, right? So the weekly email gives you an opportunity to deepen those. They know that you they know that you love them because of the way you handle the transaction. They know that you're there. They know they understand the relationship. And then the email just keeps keeps you in front of them. Where when they get ready to do something, they call you. They know when they call you answer, and you get right on whatever it was they wanted. They wanted. Even if it's not to buy or sell something, these people are family to you now. My clients are my extended family. I call it the FE effect. Friend or family effect. I was talking to, to somebody in the back, and he said, man, when I met you a while ago, I've seen you on YouTube, but when I met you a while ago, it was like, man, I feel like I've known you forever. Because I give that effect that I've known you forever, okay? It's a skill. And the thing is, the skill comes from intent. Genuinely caring about people. When you care about them, they feel it. If you're there for just a deal, they feel that too. And so you gotta decide what side of the track you're on. Because I promise you right now, the intent of caring about people and the way it makes people feel you're going to do long-term business, right? This, this is where people get a little bit sideways with my strategy. They think that it's so long-term. They think it's so long-term to ask people what you can do to help them. But where's the conversion at? You don't got to convert. You got to connect. They've already decided when they want to buy or sell something. It's not up to you to talk them into it. It's your job to connect with them. Make sure they don't have another agent that they're wanting to work with and that the door is open for you to begin this relationship and then be there for them until they decide, right? So the weekly email, is, is it gives you scalability. It shows them how dependable, hardworking, honest, professional. It, it does all that for you across as many people as you want. I spend 30 minutes on it a week and I can. it doesn't matter if I have a thousand, or 50,000, it still takes 30 minutes. That's scalability. I'm able to scale my business to where I spend 30 minutes a week on all my total database every week. And then outside of that, I'm just working my deals. Who needs to do something? Who can I help? Now, the weekly email to me, I mean, that's just, that's, that's like the end all be all, okay? But say you don't wanna do that, okay, cool. It's still, whatever your system is, it's gotta be consistent, and it's gotta be something real, right? But scalability is using technology to, to nurture your relationships. That's scalability. Efficiency is because you know property owners are unlimited, you do nothing but talk to property owners all day long because you can't talk to all of them, why would you talk to anybody else? Scalability is staying in front of them with some sort of technology forever, right? So I get back in, I'm doing really good. I made 80,000 in 2008 and I was a stat. I was making 40 on the whole rig, you know, almost dying several times, super dangerous. Now I'm back, I mean, it. I mean, it all, like, like, I can almost get emotional about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, getting back in the game after being knocked down so hard and, and coming back the way that I did, um, it was a real feeling. 2009, I do 100,000. I'm like, yeah, let's do this thing, right? 2010, boom, the oil spill. BP oil spill completely 
devastates our area. Okay, I'm right on the Alabama Florida go, uh, line, right on the right on the Gulf Coast. White Sandy Beach is million dollar condos. The oil spill happens, and the media blew it up, scared everybody. For me, it was like they should have, because what if it would have been something crazy, right? What if it would have like been some poison that killed a bunch of people? They didn't know. A lot of people are mad at the media for blowing it up the way they did. But really, they did what they needed. They did what they were, I think they did what they should have done. So nobody came to our area, no, no tourists. We normally get 6 million tourists a year. Our, our population is 20,000. Small town. But our, but our tourism is 6 million. That year, it was, I don't know, very little, okay? Agents were leaving the beach and going to Birmingham. It's going to be black seas forever. You know, they kept playing the video of the, the seal and the, you know, up in Alaska and stuff. Everybody was scared. Owners were dumping their condos. And when this happened, I recognized it because, like, when the oil spill happened, I lost, like, five contracts I had under contract. They backed out. They were scared and they backed out of deals I had under contract pending. And to me, immediate sign of a crash, right? Prices are going down, people are scattering, that's a crash. I didn't know where, how big of a crash or how small of a crash was going to be, but I knew it was a crash. And I said, yes, this is my opportunity to try out my theories of what I learned in the big crash, to see if I could really make it through a crash. Do closings really continue to happen every day? His business completely unlimited. You know, all that stuff I was talking about a while ago. I had an opportunity to actually see if that was really true. It's not like I went through the crash and, I, and, I, and then I figured it out and I thought, oh yeah, I'm just going to start telling people that stuff and see what happens. No, I actually tested this in a mini crash that we had with the oil spill. In 2010, I made more money. I made 150000 that year. I made 100,000 the year before. I made 50 more thousand in, this, in one of the scariest years we've ever had, right? Um, that to me was like my real aha moment in real estate. That was when I thought I've got something figured out. Like I don't know if I have it all figured out and everything, but I, I, there's some, I've got something, something big here. And all I did was simply the same thing I was doing, contacting property owners, but it just, you, you're an information provider. Real estate agents are information providers, okay? It was my job during that time to inform people what's going on with the oil spill and to see if there's something I could do to help them. They wanted to dump their condos. I listed and sold condos for dirt cheap prices and should have bought them. And those people were scared, they got out. Should they have gotten out? Maybe, maybe not, whatever. It was my job to help them do what they wanted to do. It's not my job to question what they want to do, right? I think a lot of agents try to put their two cents in on why a client should or shouldn't do something. Like they're looking at a house and you think, nah, I think you should get this house over here. Shut up. <laughs> Let them buy the house. You know what I'm saying? A lot of agents do that. A lot of people in this room do that, I know. Don't do it. Let the client do what they want to do, regardless of what you think, right? Like, guide them through the market. Tell them, you know, we'll negotiate the best. Like, do your thing. But don't try to make life decisions for people. I don't think. Not in my opinion. So, anyway, I made more money in the, during, during the year of the oil spill. This is my aha moment. I had always wanted to be a Remax, and this was my opportunity. Like, I didn't want to go because I was scared of the desk beat. <laughs> Straight up. But when, it, but it, it's like the desk beat is consistent, right? It's every month, right? I didn't want to go there. I knew I wanted to be there, but I didn't want to go there until I knew that my income was going to be consistent. I had to line up the consistency of my income with the consistency of the desk fee before I took the desk fee on. So when I made more money that year, that was the moment I realized I could do this regardless of what happens to the market, I'm moving. I went to Remax, I combined, 
what I was doing with the biggest brand in real estate and it's really started gaining momentum. 2014, I sold 100 properties. I was the number one Remax agent in, in Alabama that year. That was 600,000 in commissions. The next year, I wanted to do a million. That would have been 2015. I wanted to do a million and I put this huge plan together. I put all the pieces, the, the pieces in place. How many people I needed to call? How many listings? How many this? How many that? I had it all drawn up. How many calls I needed to make per day, per week? How many listings I wanted to get? All this stuff. And I got to work. January 1st, 2015. January, February. By March, I'm looking at my yearly track record here, and it looks like I'm going to make the same amount of money this year as I made last year. I'm doing 50,000 a month again when I'm trying to do 80. What's wrong? What is wrong with me? Right? Really upset. I became depressed. To a certain extent, I don't really get depressed. <laughs> but I was like, that curiosity side of me was like, what's wrong? Let's search for the answers. <coughs> I got back on my reading. I was reading, I was watching, I was studying, I was Googling. I was Googling the top agents in the country. They were selling like 800 million a year and stuff and reading all their stuff. And that, that led me down a trail that made me hire a coach. I hired a coach, probably April 2015. And I wanted to know, how do I make a million dollars, right? I think there's, there's three different reasons why somebody needs a coach. They either don't know what they're doing at all, they need to know the fundamentals, the basics, they don't understand anything, right? Or maybe they know what to do, they just need some accountability to make them do it. Or maybe they're good there, maybe they know what to do and they're accountable to themselves, but they have some kind of mental thing going on that's holding them back. So I hired this coach thinking, I'm accountable. I, mean, I don't have to worry about that. I'm mentally stable. I don't have to worry about that. I got to be doing something wrong fundamentally. So I hired the coach and said, give it to me. I had that coach for four months. Okay, and then I fired him. It's $1,000 a month. Good um, Was that I was heading in the right direction. I was doing all the right things, but you got to be patient. <coughs> there's a place in life when there's people who are really hungry, really ambitious, really wanting, and but they never quite achieve the goals that they want because they're always moving it up a little further. It's like a carrot. They're always moving it, and they're never happy. They're always unhappy because they're never where they want to be because they keep moving the target. Right? Then there's the people who are super satisfied, super happy, who will never amount to be anything. They're dissatisfied in life, they're not gonna do anything, but they're happy, right? What I realize is there's a happy medium, and that's where I live. Now, ever since, whenever, whatever month that was in 2015, this is where I live. I live in complete happiness, but at the same time, super motivated. Okay? Am I, do I move the goal all the time? Yes. Yes. But you got to be happy where you're at, too. You got to love the process. You can't just, you know, have that hunger, have that drive. But don't forget why you're doing it. Don't forget that you, it doesn't need to steal your happiness from you. Right? And when you can combine being happy with being motivated, now you're in a whole nother level. You'll start doing YouTube videos and posting on Instagram. You'll have like 25,000 followers. You'll start doing free coaching, start writing books, start speaking to people in Miami. You'll start doing all kinds of crazy things. But that's what I realized with that coach is that I was doing all the right things. I needed to be happy with where I was, keep doing what I'm doing and be patient. I think there's four keys to success. 
You got to believe. You got to work hard. You got to adapt. And you have to be patient. And what I found is the people that, there's a lot of people that believe. Everybody believes, right? But out of the whole group of people that believe, very few of those people work hard. And out of, the, out of the, this little group of people who believe and work hard, very few of those people are also adapt. We'll try things, see what works, see what doesn't work, try to figure things out. And out of, the, out of that even smaller group of people that believe, work hard, and adapt, even fewer are also patient. I could talk to anybody in this room for two to five minutes. If you're not as successful or as successful as you want to be, and I can tell you which of these four things you're lacking in. Because this is it. You either don't really believe. You're not really working hard. You're doing the same thing over and over again. Or maybe you're doing everything right, but you're just not patient. Because things take time. Does that make sense? I guess I'll wrap it up with this. And then I want to take questions. Then I want to take questions because I think most of the value is going to be in, in the Q&A. I think a lot of the things that you, you guys want to know and a lot of other people want to hear are going to be within your questions. And that's where I'm going to get really hyped. I sold 100 properties in 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 dollars. I don't care. Because I wasn't trying to do that. I was trying to help people. So forget about your, your results, your goals, like at the end of the year. It doesn't matter. Don't focus on the results, okay? Focus on your daily actions. Focus on your daily actions and how many people that you can try to help. Focus on how many people you're trying to get in front of to help. Not how many properties you're gonna sell, not how many listings you're trying to get. Just focus on the people. Market share is not how many listings you have. How many closings you did. Uh, you know, it is not. Market share, okay, to me, we all trade stocks on Wall Street on the future earnings of companies. Okay? I trade stocks or market share of real estate agents on their future earnings. And to me, their future earnings are how many real relationships that they have in place with property owners in the area. So to me, market share is, what, whoever owns the market share doesn't own the amount of transactions this year because if a top producer sells 500 properties this year, but this other no-name agent has more relationships with property owners in the area, he's gonna smash that big guy the next year. He owns the market share. So, I love you guys. Thank you guys so much for coming.